Great games are played, not made. This is a driving philosophy for Todd Howard, game director and executive producer at Bethesda Game Studios. The phrase has since become the Bethesda mantra, coined during the development of The Elder Scrolls III, Morrowind, the first major title led by Howard. Since then, under Howard's leadership, the company has risen from a developer struggling to survive to one of the fastest-growing powerhouse publishers in the entire industry. This is the story of how Todd Howard grew from a young college student unable to get a job as a designer to an experienced developer shepherding the creation of some of the biggest RPGs ever released. Todd Howard was born in 1971 in the small Pennsylvania suburb of Lower McCungie Township. He developed an interest in technology and video games at a young age, convincing his parents to buy him an Apple II computer. Howard cites Wizardry as the title that first inspired him to make games, and Ultima III as his biggest influence. He also taught himself how to program and began writing his own crude games when he was very young. Origin Systems, the company behind the Ultima games, quickly became Howard's favorite developer because he felt that they didn't just make games, they crafted entire worlds that the player could travel to. In particular, he respected the way Origin developed Ultimas 3 through 7, as they completely overhauled their development tools and systems with each new title, truly improving upon their work. This was a philosophy that would come to guide Howard's own projects. Howard attended the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia, and though he desired to focus on game development, he majored in finance. Howard later explained that he took this subject as it seemed like, quote, the easiest way through school. Despite this, Howard would often go to the campus's computer labs after class and install Wing Commander on one of their desktops so that he could play. Several times, the workstation where he'd installed Wing Commander had already been taken, and he eventually decided that it was too time-consuming to install the game on a new computer every day. Howard used this as an excuse to convince his parents to buy him his own computer, telling them that it would help his workflow. At some point, Howard acquired a copy of Wayne Gretzky Hockey 3, developed by Bethesda Games. After looking at the company's address on the box, he realized that their offices were along the commute home from his college for the holidays. On a whim, while still attending school, Howard applied to work at the company, only to be declined and told to apply again once he'd graduated. And after completing his education, Howard tried once more, but was again declined. It wasn't until 1994 that Bethesda would officially hire Todd Howard. He began his work for Bethesda right after The Elder Scrolls Arena was released. Some cite his first task for the company as converting the game from MS-DOS to CD-DISC. This would be his first work on the series that would earn him his fame and acclaim in the industry. The first project Howard worked on at Bethesda in a real capacity was 1995's Terminator Future Shock, a first-person shooter based in the universe of the Terminator franchise. This title was one of the first to use fully texture-mapped three-dimensional environments. It also pioneered the use of mouse-based camera controls months before Quake popularized the idea. Future Shock wouldn't be Howard's only brush with the Terminator franchise. His next work was as a designer on 1996's Terminator Skynet. Though it was originally conceived as just an expansion pack for Future Shock, Skynet slowly grew larger and larger before becoming its own game. On August 31st, 1996, Bethesda released their sequel to Arena, titled The Elder Scrolls Daggerfall, which featured a massive open world. Bethesda themselves boast that it was roughly the size of Great Britain, around 230,000 square kilometers. In reality, it was actually closer to 161,000 square kilometers, slightly smaller but no less impressive. Thousands of villages dot the landscape of Daggerfall, populated by literally hundreds of thousands of NPCs. With so much content, there was no way the designers could craft it all by hand, so parts of Daggerfall's world were randomly generated, including much of its wilderness and several building interiors. In retrospect, it would seem obvious that this would take a toll on the game, with some critics describing the world and characters within it as monotonous. Criticism that Bethesda, and perhaps Howard himself, would take to heart. In 1998, Howard was given his first opportunity to lead a project at Bethesda. Inspired by titles like Tomb Raider and Prince of Persia, the company sought to create a series of action-adventure games under the Elder Scrolls Adventures banner, and the first title in this planned franchise was known as Redguard. A very different approach to the Elder Scrolls universe, Redguard was a third-person action RPG with linear progression rather than a first-person RPG with an explorable open world. Redguard also featured a main character with a set name and race, Cyrus the Restless, instead of letting the player create their own character. While Redguard was a solid game that found decent commercial success, it was a symptom of a much larger problem at Bethesda. The company went through some troubled times during the late 90s after Daggerfall's release. Between projects like Redguard 
Battle Spire and the cancelled Tenth Planet, the studio spread itself too thin and was in danger of going out of business. Things were looking quite bleak until the year 2000 when Bethesda was acquired by Zenimax Media, a move that Howard described as giving us kind of a new lease on life, and the company moved forward with a new installment in the Elder Scrolls franchise. Though he was in charge of this project and the entire future of Bethesda potentially rested on his shoulders, Howard wasn't afraid and poured his all into this game. He explained, The studio had gotten that small and I was in charge of Morrowind, but by that time, once you get to that point, there was an element of no fear. What's the worst that could happen? We could go out of business. Well, let's go all in. This is the game. Let's put all our chips on the table. This is the game people want from us. This is the game we want to do. The developers scrapped the engine they had used in previous titles and made a completely new one powered by Microsoft's Direct 3D software. Remembering the criticisms of Daggerfall and taking cues from his experience with Redguard, Howard and his team decided to craft almost everything in Morrowind by hand instead of randomly generating assets. To accomplish this, Bethesda tripled its staff and spent the entirety of Morrowind's first year of development creating the Elder Scrolls Construction Kit, a file system that allowed designers to tweak and rebalance aspects of the title quickly and on a small scale instead of broad, inaccurate strokes. Howard would affectionately refer to it as a role-playing operating system. The construction set shipped with Morrowind and spawned an active modding community, one that remains with Bethesda's titles to this day. By the end of development, Howard and his staff put in close to 100 man-years to create Morrowind, which was released on the PC on May 1st, 2002, and ported to the Xbox on June 6th, 2002. The game was a massive success, with critics praising the size and scope of its world and the amount of detail Bethesda was able to cram in it. The title sold more than 4 million copies in its lifetime and remains a massively important game for the studio, so much so that bits of its code remain in everything Bethesda Game Studios makes to this day, for better and for worse. After Morrowind's success, Howard and his team at Bethesda did not rest and instead looked to the future. In 2002, they split their team, with artists and designers going to work on Morrowind's expansions, Tribunal, and Blood Moon, and programmers beginning work on their next major title, The Elder Scrolls IV, Oblivion. While Morrowind's lead designer Ken Ralston oversaw the development team, Howard himself was promoted to executive producer. Bethesda took their time with this game, giving it a four-year development cycle. Howard explained that they did this so Oblivion could be a reinvention of Morrowind and stand on its own. Harkening back to his influences with Ultima, Howard believed that this approach would capture much of what made Bethesda's past titles so exciting in the first place. While there were fewer NPCs and quests, and Oblivion greater care was put into each of their design and writing. Quests would have multiple branching paths, and characters would have more unique personalities. For the main quest, the team decided against having the player be a chosen one, as they'd been in their earlier games. Instead, they believed it would be more interesting to have the player character track down and help the chosen one. Though there was quite a bit of voice acting in Morrowind, Oblivion was fully voiced and featured several prominent actors, including Patrick Stewart, Sean Bean, and Terrence Stamp. Use of mainstream actors would become the norm in Bethesda's following titles. Just as they'd done with Morrowind, Bethesda decided to throw out their current technology and crafted a new engine for Oblivion. The final product was a mixture of in-house tech and Numerical Designs' Gamebryo engine. Other new technology was also incorporated into the game, including various physics engines, facial animation and lip-syncing tech, and environmental development tools like the foliage-creating speed tree. A radiant AI system was also implemented, which made NPC behavior more dynamic. All of these changes paid off, as Oblivion received universal acclaim from critics, resting at a monumental 94 out of 100 on Metacritic. By November of 2011, the title had sold over 3.5 million copies. While Oblivion was a success and the future was looking bright for Howard and his team at Bethesda, elsewhere in the industry, things weren't as cheerful. For years, Black Isle Studios and Interplay Entertainment's Fallout 3, then codenamed Van Buren, languished in development hell. And in 2004, the struggling Interplay struck a deal with Bethesda to allow the developers to produce and publish several Fallout games. Bethesda eventually obtained the Fallout license permanently. While Howard and his team started pre-production on Fallout 3 in 2004, principal development did not begin until Oblivion was released in 2006. For this new title, Howard once again stepped into the role of producer while simultaneously acting as director. The title was similar in scope to Oblivion, but offered a unique challenge for Howard and his team, as its post-apocalyptic capital wasteland was a very different setting from the familiar Tamriel. Regardless, Bethesda approached Fallout 3 the same way they'd approached Morrowind and Oblivion, allowing their ideas for its world to grow organically. 
Because the Fallout universe was so thick with its own lore, a solid foundation had already been built, calming fears amongst some in the development team that Fallout 3 wouldn't have its own tone. Upon its release, Fallout 3 was an even bigger hit than Oblivion, selling 4.7 million copies by the end of 2008. It averaged a 91 out of 100 on Metacritic. And because of the tremendous success of Fallout 3, Bethesda's parent company decided that a sequel should be fast-tracked. However, instead of handing the project to Howard and his team, the reins were instead given to Obsidian Entertainment, a developer formed by several former Fallout 2 developers from Black Isle Studios. This decision was made for good reason, as Howard and Bethesda Game Studios wanted to revisit the world of Tamriel. Plans for the next Elder Scrolls game were put in place after Oblivion's release in 2006, but again, development did not hit full steam until Fallout 3's release in 2008. With this new title, Howard yearned to return to the style of Morrowind. He wanted players to be able to explore a distinct and unique culture, as opposed to the classic Tolkien-inspired high fantasy setting in Oblivion's Cyrodiil. He also wished for the player's race to have a larger impact on gameplay. To accomplish this, Skyrim, the home of the proud but often xenophobic Nords, was chosen. Just like with Oblivion and Morrowind, a new engine was developed for Skyrim, built to further the possibilities of Gamebryo. This new toolset, called the Creation Engine, was also built with a creation kit that allowed developers to tweak content on a small scale. Similar to the Elder Scrolls construction set, it also allowed for modders to easily craft their ideas and put them into the game, a practice that was now a staple for Bethesda's releases. Skyrim was released on November 11, 2011 to near-universal acclaim. It furthered the success of both Fallout 3 and Oblivion, hitting true mainstream appeal and selling over 20 million copies as of June 2013. A huge contributor to Skyrim's achievements may have been Howard's philosophy towards game design. He believes that a developer could create a huge design document detailing exactly what a game was going to do, but designers often get too attached to these ideas. Instead, Howard suggests that developers should just put ideas into their game and see what works, without feeling afraid to kill features that simply don't. An example of one such feature in Skyrim was the title's Dragons. They began as a single page in the Skyrim design document, describing how encounters with the beasts should feel. The idea grew and became an integral part of the experience. Howard maintains that features grown naturally like this are the best parts of their games. Whenever a new game from Bethesda is released, many people ask for the company to simply add more content. While doing this is important, Howard believes his team should instead focus on combining superfluous ideas and systems to make what the player does, who they are and what they do, more meaningful. Whether or not this has always been beneficial is up for debate, but it's clear that if there's any flaw with Howard and his team's philosophies on creating games, it's that they are too ambitious. For better and for worse, that is respectable in its own right. This was evident with the studio's latest release, Fallout 4, which sacrificed many of its predecessors' deep role-playing mechanics for a far more streamlined approach to game design, while simultaneously adding town-building mechanics and a fully-voiced player character. Bethesda also worked with Microsoft to bring user-created mods to their home console, with Sony following suit with a much more stripped-down version of the feature. Fallout 4 has been the company's biggest launch yet, shipping more than 12 million copies in just a single day. Howard's leadership has treated his company well, earning nearly all of their games multiple Game of the Year awards and allowing Bethesda to expand and bring more talented studios into their fold, including the celebrated id Software and Dishonored developer Arcane Studios. Much of the company's success has been attributed to Howard's leadership on their flagship RPGs, which has also earned him personal acclaim. In 2012, he was named Best Game Director by the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, one of the highest awards in the industry. And in 2014, he received the Laura of Honor, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the German Game Awards. Finally, in 2017, the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences inducted Howard as the 22nd member of their Hall of Fame. Todd Howard is a man that started as an excited gamer eager to work in the industry he loved but grew into a passionate leader responsible for some of the most celebrated RPGs of the modern age. Hopefully, his story is far from over. Did you also know that both Morrowind and Oblivion were teased in Howard's first major title, The Elder Scrolls Adventures Redguard, or that the plot of Oblivion was teased in Morrowind? For more Elder Scrolls facts, check the annotation on screen to watch the Did You Know Gaming video on The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. 
And hey, I'm Lee. I made this video. If you'd like to check out a similar documentary chronicling the life of one of gaming's most important developers, check out this video we did about a year ago on the life and work of Satoru Iwata, the late game developer and president of Nintendo.